Great. Welcome back to Senate Education, Wednesday, January 18th, 335. We're going to hear from uh, Christine Holquist, the Executive Director of Vermont Community Broadband Board. And uh, we'll be in just a moment. We're not just in a center for letting me know. Yeah, absolutely. And there's Mr. Fish. Can you hear us, Rob? I can hear you. Oops. Okay. With the irony, if this doesn't work, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and is uh, Christine joining you? Uh, I had assumed that she was already on. Uh, let me find out. <laughs> She's joining now. You turn the volume up a little bit. Yeah. Nice background. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So this is the, the fiber that was delivered to the, the whack yard um, over the summer. Uh, Ms. Holquist, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Thanks. Thanks for uh, having us. Yeah, thank you both for joining us. Uh, so the reason, of course, we're interested in, in learning how the CUDs and, and broadband expansion are going generally but with a particular eye towards schools and of course families, uh, kids who are at home, if they ever needed to be home again as a re you know, for COVID or some other unforeseen situation that may hit us in the future. But our eye of course is toward education and uh, you know, toward what I just sort of outlined. So I just wanna give you, the two of you, the, the floor, tell us where things are at generally in the state and then we can talk specifically about education. And yeah, thank you. But I would add too that it's not you know we'll get to it later in the slides, but it's it's not just about the school itself, right? It's also about access to knowledge, you know. So we're we're going to talk yeah. about our our digital equity plan and how people who are on the other side of the digital divide are at a disadvantage because they don't you know you, you think about what we use our internet for, especially with this if you're familiar with this chat NGP program that's out that can actually write papers for you. You know, the, the world is a, so entrenched in the digital world these days. So we'll talk about all that. Thank you. And Great. of course, it's our favorite topic. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Rob, Rob's going to uh, run the slides. Um, okay. We'll kind of give you a status of where we are uh, and uh, how, why it's important to the communities and, and uh, we'll take it from there. So, of course, uh, it's Rob and I. We actually have a... a, a a, a pretty good staff right now, and and our staffing is important in terms of future funding. The actual broadband equity access and deployment program, which is part of the uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, you know, we could look at could be looking at hundreds of millions of dollars. But they want to make sure that we have a strong staff. So I'll, I'll talk about what we've done in order to put that in place. Next slide. Okay. Chris, is everybody seeing the full screen right now? Yes, yeah, I'm we seeing are. it. Yes. Okay. Um, for some reason, not having my controls when I'm sharing this. Speaking of technology problems here. I'm really sorry, I'm gonna to have to switch this and it's it's not showing my screen for the presentation side of things. Huh, it was showing for us. For, Hayden, I wonder if, yeah, I hate to put this on. Hate, I, unfortunately, I'm running, a, I'm running a Linux computer, so I mine won't show up right. Yeah, it's showing up. I just can't switch between the slides, but uh, you got it, Hayden. Thank you. All right, Hayden's got that. it. Thank you. All right, perfect. <laughs> All right, so talking about the mission, uh, you know, I, I'll put this in our words. There's, we have three main uh, main missions. One is to get everybody connected, and as you'll hear, we believe we've got the funding and the planning to get everybody connected. The next step is to make it affordable, and that's the challenge we're working on right now. And one of the ways to address affordability is to get as much grant funding as possible, because every $50 million we receive in grant funding, we can reduce the cost by $10 to the end customer. Um, and then the third component, which is the component I'm sure the Education Committee wants to focus on, is maximizing positive social impact. And what I'm proud to say and happy to say is that is also the goal of the funders. You know, we have $62.5 billion available from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. 
equity is an important component of the planning uh, as the uh, as the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, who's managing the funds, says, bead without equity is bad. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just hit, hit some of the highlights, the main focus series in 2022. You know, our focus in 2020 was to, to 22 was to build capacity. At the beginning of the year, you know, that was Rob and I. Uh, today, we have a pretty robust staff. We have a, an engineering function. We, we have a financial function. Uh, we have a, um, you know, the whole legal function as well. Uh, and this is all really uh, put in place through Act 71. Act 71 was a very innovative piece of legislation. It really has become the envy of a number of states throughout the country are trying to, to, uh, to copy, copy what we're doing. Uh, you know, we have several years ahead of them. Uh, in terms of carrying this out, but you know, it, it, uh, Nebraska is the latest state that's trying to do uh, mimic what we've done. We are leading the country. Um, the NTIA has stated that to our board in terms of everything we're doing here. So I certainly want to thank the legislature for a very uh, well con constructed piece of legislation. And, and speaking of construction, um, Rob will give you a little more detail. But we're providing funds today, and and we're constructing and getting people connected. And then the other part of our job is to make sure that uh, we we have the accountability in place, and we monitor the performance. You know, we we've, we've got outside uh, uh, plant specifications that that the uh, providers need to comply with, and of course we've got the communication union districts that are going to hold the providers accountable. Next slide, please. So as we talked, you know, in 2023, you need more than a good school for a good education. I talked a little bit about that. You know, it's not just, you know, access when when they can't get to school. Of course, we, you know, with with all the uh, illness that's going around today, you know, I'm very pleased that, you know, we can have a virtual office because, you know, when I've got a fever, I can sit here in front of my computer and the computer won't won't catch what I got, um, but we can continue to function. So, so productivity in the work world is shown to increase significantly. When we talk about school age, you know, education and training, and even into the area of career technical education, having those resources available, the knowledge available, uh, is uh, is critical. And I've, you know, I just finished reading a recent study about, uh, you know. China's education a few years ago was the envy of the world. Now it's no longer the envy of the world because knowledge is becoming a commodity. And it really is about creativity and collaboration, which is important because knowledge can be accessed uh, no matter where you are, assuming that you're connected. So this is, this I, I wanna emphasize how important it is not only be connected while you're, while you're in school, it's while you're out of school, and even that ties down to some of our technical challenges. For example, you know, we're working with a housing and urban development uh, organizations throughout the state, housing organizations. And you know, some of these uh, multi-dwelling units are provided through cable and the kids come home from school and all of a sudden they don't have the bandwidth they need. So even down to the technical specification to ensure that that equal opportunity for all uh, doesn't isn't restricted by by your ability to pay. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm gonna take a, a few moments to go over what's happening around the state right now, but I just wanna echo what Christine said is, the, the, the walls of the school building is not where education ends anymore, it's the entire community. So that's where our focus comes in. And when it comes to educational equity, there's only so much you can control at the home. One thing you can control and to assure is equal is providing providing ubiquitous fiber access to, to all students. And that would be our goal here. Uh, the legislature decided that our implementation mechanism is primarily gonna be these entities, these are municipalities that are called communication union districts. Uh, this provides both construction, but also oversight and accountability for what is happening and a way for the community to respond. Uh, during during COVID, during the worst of COVID, I'll leave it at that, uh, these entities were incredibly important for identifying Wi-Fi hotspots, for communicating with the superintendents of the schools, for pro providing access and documenting problems. And that's only continued as we moved into the, 
phase of where we're constructing permanent infrastructure. We're not into, we're not looking at interim solutions right now. Um, I'm happy to report now that five of the districts are in the construction phase, uh, including Southern Vermont, which has partnered with Consolidated Orphidium Fiber. And as of now, they're planning to have the entire district built out by the end of this calendar year. Uh, there's also construction happening up in the Kingdom, Central Vermont, uh, Maple Broadband in Addison County, uh, Deerfield Valley connected their first customers a few days ago, which is exciting. Uh, and then EC Fiber, the, the original CUD. Uh, we've now reached the point though that 214 of Vermont's towns are members of communication union districts. Each one of these towns has two representatives to the board. This covers 76% of the state's population and 93% of the, the unserved areas. We're, we're making progress, we're excited for the next year. And during the next year, we believe that the other CUDs will also be beginning construction. Uh, next slide. But we not, are not only focusing on CUDs. They're our primary method for delivering service, but we, if you don't live in a CUD, you still need to get service. And we're happy to report that elsewhere in the state, stuff is happening. Uh, starting in the North, I'm gonna fill in some of the holes here. Uh, Town of Fletcher has uh, received a grant from the Northern Borders Regional Commission to build out fiber to the premise. Uh, I believe that Consolidated is also gonna be building out fiber in that area this year. Heading south, we've been working closely with Waitsfield Champlain Telecom. Uh, they received a grant this summer to connect their, the addresses that aren't on fiber will be moved to fiber in a phased approach. Uh, further south there, you have the various areas that are TDS. So this is uh, Ludlow and Perkinsville. They have plans to build nine, fiber to 90% of their customers. Uh, they're, in the, they're in the contracting phase at this point, but I believe that that's gonna be launched this summer. Uh, then you have the VTEL area where the, the it's they report serving their addresses with fiber, and then uh, back to Southern Vermont here. Even the small town of small Gore of Glastonbury uh, is now connected with fiber. Those I think it's six or eight residents now. Uh, so we're, we're making progress on a statewide level uh, through the CUDs and and beyond. So um, next slide. Uh, quickly. I want to talk about the funding out the, out the door. It's no use holding on to the funds when they have the capacity, have the accountability, and have the skills to move forward. We want to be getting those funds out the door. We've already distributed um, $122 million in funding. And uh, this slide actually doesn't include the other about $2.3 million that we approved last week. Our board meets monthly now. It had been uh, every other week for about four hours. And uh, we put these groups through the ringer to make sure that they, they have the skills, they have the expertise, have the accountability to, to get it done, to meet design standards, and to ensure that we are gonna be having 100 by 100 service statewide. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I, you know, I touched on this before, you know, the, uh, afford a, the, uh, the challenge of providing service to the unserved areas today is they're the areas that are the most expensive to serve. So, you know, we've got the areas that are most expensive to serve are also the ones that can least afford it. So if you look at the Northeast Kingdom, for example, NEK Broadband has 57 towns in its, in its communication union district. And if you overlay energy burden, uh, that, you know, people are struggling up there. So we're going to continue to reinforce, the, you know, that we're, we need to get as much grant funding as possible in order to, uh, uh, and in order to keep right, to make it affordable. So uh, grants and creative financing, we're doing a tremendous amount of work to look at different ways we can finance this. For example, one of the low, there's low, if we have to go to the bond market, you know, we're gonna look for low, low cost bond funding, for example, ESG bonds, environmental, social and uh, governance bonds. We really hit, hit the mark on that, you know, from an environmental standpoint, um, providing, uh, reliable connections not only is help the smart grid in order to increase the penetration of renewables, it also enables customers to take advantage of special pricing programs to lower their cost of energy as well as uh, improve the the grid's ability to uh, absorb uh, new renewables. So those are the kind of the creative financing, the ways we're trying to attack this thing. Next slide, please. Okay. 
Uh, Christine, this might be a good opportunity to talk about the Middle Mile program. And oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I'll talk about that. Yeah, so we also, uh, thanks Rob. We also uh, applied for a, uh, a grant program that this, the federal government is offering a billion dollars and they're gonna make 10 to 15 grants available. That means they're pretty significant grants. Initially, we looked at that and say, you know, you know, how can Vermont compete with all these other states? But we, the reason we, we are able to compete and we are able to create such a robust uh, application is because we are small and we all work together. So we're one of the, uh, the only states that put in an application that looks at the statewide network and has the major telecom providers participating with the program. The idea on the middle mile program is we are able to design a robust and resilient network you know, with sub rings throughout the state with geographic redundancy. So if you lose connection because a tree fell on the east, the feed for the east, it'll feed for the west. So uh, pretty proud to say that you know, we did a, a remarkable job of putting that together. And that would provide another $116 million in funds should we win that grant. So uh, that is going to require a $30 million match from the state. That'll be coming through from the Budget Adjustment Act. And we're actually testifying to the uh, Appropriations Committee on Friday about that. Right, I want to talk this... about workforce development because this involves this, the uh, career technical education uh, centers throughout the state. Uh, this, so, you know, every problem is an opportunity. When we look at the project management of this program, you, whenever you do a good project management, you look at the timeline and you say, what are the key constraints? And one of the key constraints, of course, is getting the workforce to do this, because we know we need at least a minimum of 200 additional, additional fiber optic technicians. And to get 200, you have to train 600, because you find people who can't work in the air, and, and, uh, and, and people don't like to work outside, those kind of things. So, it was quite the challenge, right? But at the same time, it's quite the opportunity because we can create a program that allow people to work, to move from lower income jobs into the higher income uh, sector. And we, we're putting a career development program together with that. We're working with uh, Vermont Technical College, who's, who's really been key to this program to you know, provide credits for the program. So people could even go on to become electrical mechanical engineers. They wanna go into IT. They can use this program. And the idea is we'll pay people to get trained. And we've made arrangements with all the major telecom providers. As soon as they leave this program, they'll go right into a paid job. So we don't interrupt, we don't interrupt their pay. We have a pay it forward program where that, you know, they work X number of years for the uh, employer. That money gets paid back so we can continue the program moving forward. Um, this has been a great collaboration and uh, it will provide a great opportunity for, for uh folks in Vermont. And uh, we've spent a lot of time developing the training because it needs to be actually in a physically in a pole yard so people can work in the air. So we built a four day training program. The first program will be offered in April during spring break for the schools. And we'll be beta testing it with the uh, CTE students. And uh, we'll, con we'll be continuing to offer that uh, into the future. Next slide, please. So, you know, digital divides the issue, equity is the goal, and inclusion is the work. Uh, this is about, you know, you get down to the basic constitution of what America is about. We're about providing equal opportunity for all. Today, that digital divide has really created a barrier for that equal opportunity. That barrier doesn't just exist in urban and rural as well, uh, because there are pockets, uh, there are urban pockets, and even including in Burlington, where that you know that the there isn't just that much money, so people don't get connected. You know, it, it, the way it's telecom has been done, because it's been done through the market, the market doesn't go where the money doesn't exist. And this program is all about addressing that issue and taking care of that uh, digital divide, so everybody can be included and have an opportunity for a better future. Next slide, please. So anyway, we, we cranked through this so we could give you some time for questions. Uh, let's open it up for questions now. Great. You can take that off. You know. uh, thank you both. That that was that was helpful. Uh, I'll just kick it off. I'm wondering if you're in connection with the Agency of Education to, to understand what schools really 
don't have access that need access. I mean, you have a, a sense of that for your work with AOE? You know, as I present to this committee, yeah. you know, I was looking at the list. So we just had a digital equity kickoff and, uh, you know, and, with, and we've been working, we, we spent the last two months reaching out to different organizations. And so, for example, we've got an advisory committee for this digital, we have a $518,000 digital equity grant from the federal government to build a five-year plan for inclusion. And that, you know, once we finish the plan, we'll get five years of funding for this. And, I'll, and we, we've reached out to the, you know, the Department of Libraries is on there, uh, Vermont uh, Department of Disability, Aging, Independent Living, Rural Development, Racial Equity, you know, uh, Refugees and Immigrants, but the Department of Education is not on there. So as soon as I started presenting this committee, I realized we missed that. Okay. So you're going to work. You're going to include the agency of education in that group. Yes, we would. That's an action item. I, I, and, I, I, I took even before you mentioned it because I realized. That, yeah, that we, okay. We, we, and, we, I mean, we're talking and, to the CTEs, but we're not talking to the schools. Okay. We should. And we'll give the agency of education a heads up. Also, I believe the education see. Well, not sure if they're in the room, but to to help work with all of you to again understand what those what schools still need to be connected. What schools are out there? We want to next year make sure that every kid can have, you know, I don't know, Chinese lessons with a native Chinese speaker, and it would have to be, you know, of course online. Do those kids have that access? Right. Yeah, I agree. And I, I will tell you, some initial conversations we've had with some of the schools has been around, the focus has been around, you know, how can we get uh, a, a, an alternative and lower, lower cost provider for the CUDs. But, you know, that's just, that's not even tipping the iceberg. I, I like the challenge you just presented to us. Yeah, and I'll show you, we do, we do have that data. Um, we have data for every E911 address in the state. We're just not prepared today to to present that, but we can get that to you. Uh, we've been a little bit overwhelmed with the FCC challenge process to try to make sure we're bringing as much money to the state as possible. Yeah. Recovering from that and uh, the superintendents were incredibly helpful in getting word out uh, as well as businesses around the state for the for the challenge process. But our, our GIS person is a little bit overwhelmed. So we apologize for not having that today, but it is something we have to create for the digital equity process and we'll certainly share that. No problem. So when you say you have that data, you're talking about what schools don't have access. Yes, the capabilities, the, the highest level of broadband speed available to each school. Yes. Right. When do you think you could? I understand you guys have been swamped with things. When do you think you might have that to us? When would it be just feasibly? You know, when is it possible? I think within the next few weeks. Uh, I'm going okay. to try to. I'm going to try to under promise and over deliver here. I, I okay. <laughs> but Senator okay. Kepi, I, I think you, you raised the bar. I mean, I think we've got, you know, we, we've got that information, we provided that information, but I think you set the bar. I like where you set the bar in terms of, we talked about equity goes beyond the walls of the school. You know, what we want to make sure every, every student has the opportunity to, to learn Chinese, you know, as, as a, wherever they are. I think that's, you know, that's, that's where we want to go from an equity what do you stand point? Yeah. There's the kind of that's and when you go to our three goals, con connected, affordable, and maximize social impact. We, you know, we think we've got the connectivity piece covered, but the maximize social impact is the challenge. Yeah. Other questions, please. Um, <clears throat> it's a good presentation. I'm just curious on the slide, which is communication union districts. If the, if the percentages indicated on the slide are uh, populations, for example, 76% of the, of the uh, state's population, is that 76% of the state's population is in a CUD or that the installation is complete? I'm not quite sure what the metric is. Is, is a part of a CUD, is in a town okay. that's a member of a CUD. Okay, so, so kind of taking it to the next step, is there any kind of... Uh, programmatic graphic that shows when installations happen over time and, and what the percentage of the population is covered now versus next year versus the following year, et cetera. Is that? That's going to, it's going to vary from communication union district to district, depending on which business model they're pursuing. Uh, it's very likely the ones that are doing the, 
the public-private partnership where they're helping an existing provider may have the build out occur, occur faster, but it's gonna vary from district to district. Although uh, so you will be able to see that on our dashboard. We're, we're gonna, so uh, I, I don't know, you've, I think you've got that link in the presentation. We do, we're gonna be very, uh, very transparent and uh, provide accountability by, we're quarterly forecasting how many addresses are getting connected. And you'll be able to go to the dashboard and see our progress on a quarterly basis on who's getting connected, where. Um, so, okay, so where are you currently? Well, currently we, you know, between uh, Southern Vermont and ADK and others, we've probably connected about 11,000 addresses. But remember last year was, getting the CUDs up to building, build, we, last year was about, we had, we focused on getting the designs in place, get it, you know, approving the business plan, issuing the grants and getting the, the CUDs staffed yeah. up to carry it out. So, you know, Rob, you're gonna see much fat, this is the year to, of construction, right? Rob showed you that five of the 10 CUDs are actually in construction now, and the others are very close. Some of those are moving very fast. Once we get into construction, things can move fast. But the past year has been really about uh, building up the broadband offices. Make you know, we we use an outside design firm, CTC, to review the designs. We review the business plans. They review the business plans, and we've issued you know we've now got grants issued to get the CUDs uh, constructing. We've also purchased materials ahead of time. One of the nice things uh, we discovered that, for example, Fiber had a one-year lead time. So we pre-purchased uh, the materials needed for the entire state. It was about a $7 million purchase, but because we did a collective purchase, we saved $2 million. So it's, it's significant savings by doing that. And also, um, we so we've got everything in place to, to really uh, okay. hit, the, hit the boot ground running. And then we, we, we encourage you to look at the, the dashboard that's linked in the presentation. I think the dashboard will be key. Got it. Uh, okay, so there's good. a few things we didn't share. That we didn't share in our underdevelopment at this point. It's going to improve because we with transparency is important here. And especially as we enter the construction phase, you're going to start seeing things happen as opposed to this study was completed and we purchased this amount yeah. of paper. Yeah. So yeah. we're excited right. for this next year. All right, Senator Senator Weeks has another follow-up. Uh, same slide. You say 93% of premises statewide <laughs> without or without access to 25-3. What's 25-3? So 25 God, yeah, that's the, that's the speed. Unfortunately, you know, twenty. This I, I don't want to get into too, too big a sinkhole here, but even that twenty-five three is not reliable. Uh, no, twenty-five is three is, yeah, but it, twenty-five three means you get twenty-five megabits down, three megabits up in terms of connection speed, and what that primarily means DSL, which is a technology, so they aren't even getting that. You might as well assume that twenty-five three is not served. It's just poor poor service. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot behind this. You know, unfortunately, we're in a battle with the telecom. We're not in a battle anymore. Consolidated has actually agreed. Um, Consolidated agreed that that 25.3 is not serviceable, and they probably don't get that. But yeah, just, just to back it up a little bit, so you have the download speed. So that's if you're if you're watching a video. If you're uploading a video, you're using that upload speed. So when it comes for all of the, anything with remote learning or having a, a class, a Chinese class taught by a native Chinese speaker, like that's where you need the, that's where you need yeah. this, you need the upload speed and, and you need and to Rob be symmetrical too. Yeah, when Rob talks about those, chi we'll, we'll use that, we'll stay with that example, training in Chinese, you're not gonna get that with 25.3. So that, so the way to think about this, if you see 25.3, it's not adequate for, for the needs of education and business. You're saying here 93% of premises statewide without access to 25.3. Yes. That's current state. That's, current. that's even worse. That's the point is that, that's, <laughs> right. that that's even worse. Yeah. Yeah. There, that it's, there's proposals out there to up the minimum broadband speed. Well, that's considered broadband is to 100 over 20. That's what most cable customers are receiving today. If you're on DSL or if you're on a wireless connection, uh, yeah. Maybe you're receiving 25.3, most likely it's more like 10.1. And there's a question of uh, how dependable that is. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I have a hundred questions. But yeah, know. yeah, no, uh, we may have the two of you back actually. You know, we sort of just touched on it. Uh, 
maybe sometime next week for another 30 minutes. I think we all have some additional questions, but we have a witness waiting and um, we need to move on. Yeah, that's, that's good. We can have the data for you. That, that by the Okay, well, that'd be great. Okay, terrific. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for the overview. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing both of you soon. Thank have you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. you. What confuses me is when it says 93% of premises statewide are without access to 25.3, that seems very discouraging. But maybe yes. I'm missing. That's on copper. Right. Yeah. It's not quite the case. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's more to explore here. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this seems like your wheel comes, so that's good. Oh, yeah. Communications, big time. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm completely ignorant. Not completely, but pretty ignorant. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is that sorry? Welcome to Senate. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you being here. Um, you are the government relations director for the American Heart Association. We have Senate Bill S10 before us, which has been put forward by Senators Chitlin, Gulick, Lyons, and Kirchlich. What we usually would do is have uh, the lead sponsor in, we'll have him in at some point, but we normally have the lead sponsor in first, followed by uh, a little bit of a walkthrough. But I'm told that you uh, wanted the bill, you're pushing for the bill, so we thought we'd kick things off with you uh, and tell us a little bit about the bill, what it does, and, and why you encourage Senator Chittenden to move forward with it. And I'm sorry if some of this is a little redundant. I didn't know which council is going to speak to it too. So I not right now. I mean they have oh, okay. so so down okay, the road. So yeah. They'll just take us through the, the, the nuts mm -hmm. and bolts. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And it's nice to see everybody here. It's not often I get to come in here. I have to say, yesterday's discussion um, by um, the Principals Association scared me a little bit because my daughter, my daughter is going to UVM to become a teacher. And Yay. I thought, oh, That's holy, great. holy cow. Well, the things she'll face, but it's great. Oh, it's a great profession. Mm -hmm. So um, the requirements of the of the bill, it would require school districts to install water bottle filling stations in new construction or those schools having major renovations. And the water bottle filling stations are not the old bubblers that you remember that you know look like that. Um, it would require a minimum of one water bottle filling station for every 200 people in the school, one on each floor of the building, and one near cafeterias, gymnasium, gymnasiums, outdoor recreational spaces, and other, other high traffic areas. So I think, and you probably know this number better than me, I think Burlington High School, for instance, since that will be a new construction school, I think they have 988 students around there or so, so five water filling stations um, in their case. Uh, it would also require that the filling stations be maintained with clean, cooled, and filtered water, and water bottles would need to be permitted in schools so kids could fill them up at, the, at these water filling stations. And the legislation would apply to school construction or major renovation that commences on or after July 1st of 2023. It would also require the Agency of Edu Education to amend its rules to include these requirements. That's kind of a major renovation you'll see, and I um, I included it in my statement for you all, is $500,000. So one of the things, I, I'm just gonna pull you back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tell us the problem out there that we're trying to solve. What, what is the problem well, that you're seeing? There are a few, and that's, and I have not surveyed Vermont schools okay. to get the lay of the land. Yeah. Um, I, nationally, we know that there are schools that don't have this. Um, I do address that a little bit. Our problem is more on the health side of, of this. Um, so what's happening out there? Help us out. What's well, the... one of the reasons this has become such a big issue in these past years is because of COVID, because people had the schools had the old bubblers that you okay. have to put your mouth on and drip your germs on it and touch the thing to make the yeah. water come in there. It's gross. Many schools actually wrote those off during COVID so people couldn't use them and spread germs. And as you'll see in the statement here, the water fountain along with the pencil sharpener handle was deemed to be in a one study, the most germiest substance in the classroom. So, so this is about germ transfer. It's, it's, that's it, part is, of it. Okay. That's part of it. I think frankly, that's one of the, issues, the reasons it's gotten traction in the past year because mm -hmm. of COVID, everyone being scared about the spread. Um, I don't know nationally what has happened. I can get that pretty easily, but I know Eastern states, since our affiliate covers the Eastern kind of side of the country, 
last year, New Hampshire, West Virginia, Rhode Island all pass uh, a law like this. Two of those pretty conservative states. So it's not a, it's not something that makes people, you know, a little squeamish about the price tag. Um, I do address. Um, I'll just go in order, but I will address the the health thing. The cost we don't see as burdensome. Um, I did include in my statement. You'll see. I think you have it. Um, kind of some pictures of some of these mm -hmm. filling stations, very similar to the ones that you see in the state house here. They range in price from like 1200 to 2000. So not, not horribly expensive. There are some costs related to the filters. Um, that's also on that, on that sheet. I can't speak for everywhere, but for instance, a three pack goes for like 230, $250 and they have to be replaced, I think every six months. And the installation costs too. And I guess it depends on who you have to do it, but the averages are on $500 to $1,000. If your facilities, staff at the school can do that even better, but it isn't an astronomical price tag by any means. Um, I actually, on the way here, um, happened to call Winooski mm -hmm. High School because they just had that major renovation to see what they did. And they have the might, the, the superintendent was in a meeting, but I did talk to the, the staff in the superintendent's office. They have the old bubblers with the, um, the water bottle filling station kind of attached to it in the older part of the building. And they do have the new water bottle filling stations in the new part of the building. So they, they did put them in. I don't know to what extent and what was done previously in the older part of the building, but they, they did it. Um, and I think that, you know, where we're coming from, the Meaning in American Heart Association, is that we really feel that water is a basic human need that everyone has to have, including kids at school. And there's no doubt that kids should have it at no cost. Um, and our schools do have, we know, the water, the regular bubblers, they have to, I think, as part of like their school lunch requirements, they need to provide water. But with COVID, it's become an issue um, because of the germ factor, et cetera. Um, and that we know um, that the other costs related to this are if we don't do anything, one of the reasons we care about this issue is obesity, because we know that sugary beverages are the biggest source of added sugars and not just kids, but adult diets. And the more we can do to get them to drink other stuff, the better. Right now, our obese and overweight rate for high school students is 27%. And we also know that 22% of Vermont middle school students drink less than a glass a day. If you install the water bottle filling stations, it can almost triple what kids drink, especially at lunchtime. And that's the measure that some of the schools were attacking. Yeah, New York, New York City did a study about this too. And, it, and it, it's just common sense. If you think like you put your mouth on it, you take like a gulp and you, yeah. uh, you have a water filling station, you can fill your bottle and have it not just at lunch, but throughout the day. And that's why it's so important to allow kids to bring the water bottles as well. Um, and, you know, the bottom of the statement that I have talks about the health impact pyramid, which is so this big thing, but basically the top of the pyramid is less effective. That's your doctor telling you, drink some water. You know you should drink some water. So you always, maybe not, so you do. Awesome. Um, I've been re I'm refilling this for the last five mm. days. At the water bottle filling station. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. But in the health impact pyramid, and that health sure. impact pyramid is a little hard for me to see. <laughs> What's at the top? <laughs> Which is there? A, that is like counseling from your physician. The, okay. the, the layer I'm talking about is yeah. that blue one. And what that is, and Commissioner Levine talks about it a lot. Okay. He does say he talks changing about healthy what? choice, easy choice, changing the context. Okay. That just means whatever we can do to make the default choice the healthy one, the better, because that it's so much easier and that's the whole healthy choice, easy choice thing. So if you go into a school and you have the water bottle filling stations, that's exactly what that is. It's the easy choice. You bring your bottle, you fill it up and it starts to change norms. It's really hard to change norms, but the more we can send the messages about healthy drinking and schools are now providing it and the legislature says it's a good thing, it starts to change. Some of it is the media, the, you know, the talk about it. Some of it is it's there. Um, and that it also prevents kids from bringing in whatever it is, their, their sugary beverages. And, and it's not always soda. You know, I'm not saying that every kid drinks soda, but, but the Gatorades and the vitamin waters are full of, full of the sugar stuff too. And, and the, you know, the coffee drinks and stuff. And so the more we can provide healthy water at a very low cost, the better. You think this would make a difference in your school? Already done. Pretty much everywhere. Okay. 
I just, yeah, want to, um, I just want to reiterate what you're saying. I worked in a library and we had a billing station and I anecdotally, I saw that 100%. Kids yeah. stop drinking the sugary beverages and they use that water fountain a lot. And they were drinking a lot of water. It was very heartwarming. It was really, again, I don't have any data, but it was anecdotal, I noticed it. Yeah, times are changing a little bit. My kids, I have, they range from 16 to 20. Um, and it's cool to have your water bottle with the stickers so you yeah, know, yeah, a thing. Yes. And so that's great. If you know, if, you, if they bring them to school and they can, that can be part of it and they can fill it with healthy water, um, fantastic. But we also in the middle section under the public health benefits, I mean, obesity and obesity prevention is part of it. But we also know that when kids are hydrated, they learn better. It helps with short term memory and attention. Um, so during the school day, if it, it's great. Um, Substituting sugary drinks with low or no calorie beverages like water can prevent excess weight gain and could cut up to 235 calories a day. So that's fantastic. Um, all the more reason to do it. Uh, so obviously we're in it because of health. It doesn't seem like a big cost burden. Um, schools are starting to do it. We just want to make sure that it does happen. And, and again, this is nothing that we're asking the legislature to fund. We're just starting with schools and uh, new schools and major renovations. Um, so we'd love, we'd love your support. Thank you. Yeah, questions. Thank you. Any pushback from schools? I mean, is there any reason? We'll probably find out tomorrow. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I really don't think so because I'm not telling a school to like every school has to do it now. It's it's when there's new construction. For example, it. the water bottles. Is there any even anecdotal uh, feedback that some schools just don't want the water bottles? Something. You know, it's the second order, third order effect. Yeah, I don't, I, I have not heard that. It, possibly kids could bring in other things. Yeah. I think you could find out pretty easily if there's something else in the in the water bottle. Um, I think it's something schools probably would like to encourage. Um, it's probably the least of their worries. I know that in West Virginia, actually before their law went into effect, they actually had a requirement that cups be provided so kids could mm -hmm have something to drink in and it may have been an income issue that they wanted to make sure if somebody couldn't bring in a water bottle, they had a cup to drink. Um, that's not required here. We just want to make sure the schools allow it. Yes, Do we really need a law to, to make this happen? I mean, can't the, couldn't the Department of Education say that all new construction is going to have bottle filling stations? That would be part of this. So the law says that the agency of education amend their rules to also yeah but i mean we're going to take if people want to move forward with this we'll take a bunch of testimony we'll hear from schools and superintendents and others to see it, what they think yeah. do you know if the architects freeman french freeman in the on the burlington school well, sorry i'm getting a little punchy right now um it's been a long day but um are they aware of this because i i should ask them how i don't many, know, i don't know that they, i have not special no <laughs> i'm not sure how many they're putting in because we're getting down to the nitty-gritty of the design phase i don't i don't know that answer i do know that the international plumbing code this is beyond my expertise, but Vermont follows that and it requires a, a traditional water fountain for every hundred students. So this is not as, I don't want to say burdensome, I guess, but not as it's too, it's for every 200 students that there'd be a water bottle filling station. So they have to be planning some kind of fountain. I just don't know if they're doing mm -hmm. water bottle filling Could you reach out to them? I, I mean, I mean, I can, it, it seems haven't. like it would be, yeah, helpful to the committee just report back, yeah, because this building's yeah, I mean, it's gonna, it's happening, yeah, yep. well before we were to start to really take this up, yeah, yeah, just send Hayden an email, but what what you found would be great. I will. Wow, thank you. Great. Anything else? Me too. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.